Hello everyone and welcome to a new episode of Tracing Text with Sylvia and Anton and coming to you live from deep in the heart of the state of Tennessee. And today, Sylvia, we have podcast number 11. That's right. And I I know that you mentioned last time that you were going to discuss Rafael Diestes uh, from the Gob- Goblin Archives. So we're really looking forward to our chat today about this uh, Galician author. And this is really an author and, and a work that uh, really takes me back to my years in high school because uh, this was required reading okay. in the Galician literature class um, when I was growing up. Um, and I hope it still is because it's really uh, good literature. It's the kind of literature that um, goes deep into the roots of um, the Galician folklore and it also makes you think because uh, it's uh, very much about uh, the life, the world around us. Uh, and I really think that uh, Rafael Dieste, even though he was probably not one of the most famous writers uh, mm-hmm. in Spain in the 20th century, uh, he's, to me, one of the most interesting, uh, one of the most underrated as well. So it's always nice to get a chance to talk a little bit about him. Right. So why don't we start with a little bit of a, his biography and background so that we can understand the context of his work. Well, he's one of these uh, writers that... Um, are ascribed to the um, generation of 1927 um, in Spain, uh, and his relative obscurity is perhaps due to the fact that he wrote both in Galician and Spanish. He did not write only in Spanish or only in Galician. There were um, authors at this uh, time in the 1920s, 30s, 40s who um, were sort of divided between, you know, I want to be a very important writer in Spain, but right. at the same time, I still want to write in Galician or in right. Catalan or in Basque, and you know that created a little bit of a conflict. So the, these ident- these national identities were in conflict, like as a Spain as a whole versus these regional. And it's not that different from what's happening nowadays. Exactly. So, yeah. So not not much has changed. <laughs> now his his literary uh, uh, career was long. It was productive, it was very fruitful, um, and most of his work uh, can be found uh, in Galician and in Spanish, Uh, but um, unfortunately uh, his works have not been translated into English. Right, but you did mention that there is uh, literary criticism and analysis of his life and work in English, however. That's right, and uh, there's a a book uh, that I actually have in my hand right now that was published in 1979 when uh, Dieste was still alive Uh uh, by Estelle Irisarri, Uh and uh, this is a woman that actually knew Rafael Dieste, corresponded with him Uh uh, when she lived in the United States, and Dieste was at this point already back in Spain. Uh, and it was published, uh, this this book is, is, is part of uh, Twain's World Author Series. Interesting. And uh, it was published, like I said, in 1979 uh, by Twain Publishers uh, out of Boston. Okay, perfect. So, uh, he was born in Galicia? That's right, in a small town uh, called Riancho, which mm-hmm. is in the northwest of Spain. Uh, he did travel widely in Europe and later in uh, South and Central America, uh, for very different reasons, um, and you know, uh, it's quite interesting that this really uh, small town in the northwest of Spain, Riancho, also produced other renowned writers, uh, like for example, the writer and politician uh, Castelao, mm-hmm. and the poet Manuel Antonio, who mm-hmm. died very young. Manuel Antonio didn't live too long, but he mm-hmm. wrote some pretty interesting poetry as mm-hmm. well. Uh, the three of them, together with Rafael Dieste. Uh, we're from Riancho, a small oh, town okay. in Galicia. However, part of Diesta's family was actually from Uruguay. Okay, so uh, in the southern cone. That's right. His uh, mother was from Uruguay and his father was Spanish. Uh, and his parents actually met in Uruguay. Okay. Uh, some of his uh, brothers and sisters were born in America, uh, but Dieste uh, was born in Riancho when the parents uh, Had returned, returned to, Spain. to Spain. That's right. Yes. Uh, as a writer, uh, he wrote all different sorts of things. He wrote plays, uh, puppet shows as well. Interesting. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, it was qu- quite quite a popular thing to do in the in the nineteen thirties, as we will see. He wrote prose, uh, literary criticism, newspaper articles, uh, and interestingly, he was also a professor of Spanish for a time 
at prestigious universities like uh, the University of Cambridge mm -hmm. in England and uh, the University of Nuevo León. Well, that's the state for, where my mother is from. Oh, well, <laughs> well, he lived in Mexico for a while. Yeah, well. so he was there in probably in Monterrey. That's right. He he spent some time in Monterrey. He spent some time in the Southern Cone, as you said before, mostly in Buenos Aires and Montevideo as well. Uh -huh. Uh, he was born in 1899, right after the loss of the uh, last Spanish uh, colonies uh, following the uh, Spanish-American War mm -hmm. of 1898. Um, and, of course, that's the beginning of that very famous generation right. of 1898. Uh, and as a playwright, actually, Dieste uh, was quite influenced by the works of um, Ramon Maria del Valle Inclán, one mm -hmm. of the um, you know most important uh, writers to come out of that generation. Which is interesting because he would be one. Well, you're going to be talking about some of his uh, short stories have these uh, kind of uh, supernatural Gothic elements. So that's not surprising. Not at all. That's that's, that's absolutely true. And Valle Inclán was also from Galicia. Yeah, so, so. which I love Valle Inclán. So yeah. Uh, now, he was um, very interested, Dieste was very interested in literature uh, and philosophy and also in art from a very early age. Uh, when he was 18, he traveled to Mexico for the first time. Mm -hmm. His brother was living there and he just went to visit, but uh, he felt uh, quite nostalgic. Mm -hmm. uh, that saudade, you know, yeah. it's typical <laughs> of uh, some of these Galician writers, and he just returned to Riancho not, uh -huh. not too long after. Uh, that's where uh, he started to study to become a teacher, okay. um, which would help him later on. Uh, but in 1921, he had to stop because he started military service in Morocco, uh, mm -hmm. of all places. Uh, he ended up having to stay in Morocco for uh, a couple of years, actually, because at some point Spain was at war with Morocco. With, uh, Morocco. Yes. And so he uh, was, Dieste was there. Um, as, as, you know, doing his military service. Right. And then, you know, he wasn't able to uh, get out of there for a while. And, right. You know, but it, eventually he did get out of there. He went back to Galicia. And that's when he actually began to work as a journalist. He changed his career path, and he realized that writing and journalism, uh, that sort of thing was going to be important in his life. He mm -hmm. wrote for several important newspapers, the Faro de Vigo, from my hometown, uh, which, by the way, is the is the oldest newspaper. I know you've mentioned it Spain. before in another podcast. <laughs> I always I mention and that, and I don't forget. <laughs> <laughs> I know you do mention that. I will never forget. Hey, at least the town is famous for something, <laughs> yes. you know. So, <laughs> uh, El Pueblo Gallego, the Galician people, is another um, newspaper that's still actually um, uh, active today. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, it was also around this time that he began to write plays uh -huh. and stories. Uh, a Fiestra Valdeira, meaning the empty window, was one of his most important plays, and he wrote it around this time. And also from the Goblin's archives, uh, Dos Archivos do Trasno, or De los Archivos del Trasgo, in the Spanish translation, right. he wrote it also around this time, at least the first version right. of this book, which went through uh, a couple more uh, versions throughout his life. He would rework the the collection of short stories, uh, you know, several times. Um, remember that uh, he enjoyed traveling. Um, he had traveled to Mexico. Then he also traveled within uh, Europe quite a bit. Uh, uh -huh. He went to London, for example. His his brother was the consul of Uruguay there. Okay, in how London. interesting. So uh, he became a Uruguayan citizen. I mean, he didn't go back to Spain. His brother then. No, his brother, um, uh, stayed, so, stayed somehow, I'm not sure exactly how, you know, that happened, but he did become the uh, consul of Uruguay. Uruguay in London, and so Dieste thought it was a you know, good opportunity to <laughs> travel Tra to London yeah. and, and see his brother there. He would, he would later travel to France, to Belgium, to Holland, different, you know, Italy, different parts of, of Europe, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, throughout his life. Uh, the Spanish Republic, of course, started in 1931 after mm -hmm. the dictatorship of uh, Primo de Rivera, and uh, so Dieste decided to become an educator at this point. He uh, joined the Misiones Pedagogicas, uh, pedagogic uh, missions, which were groups of people that traveled around Spain doing certain you know, cultural things. For example, uh, putting on theater plays and puppet shows. That's where yes. the <laughs> puppet show thing happened. Uh, happened, yes. And, uh, and it's, uh, Lorca did that as well, didn't he? Yes, Lorca was was a, uh, uh, Federico Garcia Lorca was a, was was a, a huge proponent of this sort of activities. Right. Uh, the theater, of course, but also puppet shows, also music. You know? Right. So they had all sorts of things um, 
that were uh, cultural in nature. Uh, and that's also, when he, while he was doing this, and he, he actually did this for several years, um, that's when he married his, his wife, uh, Carmen, uh, mm -hmm. whom he met uh, in Cáceres in Spain uh, during these, these years. Uh, but of course, this would come to an abrupt ending mm -hmm. uh, in 1936 because of the uh, Spanish Civil War. Right. Um, remember the nationalists of Franco right. versus the Republicans who supported the Republic, exactly. the Spanish Republic of 31. Um, and so during that time, during the Civil War, 1936 to 39, uh, Dieste supported the Republican side, mm -hmm. uh, not Franco. Uh, and he worked on several cultural publications uh, in favor of uh, the Republicans. Uh, for example, Hora de España, mm -hmm. Hour of Spain, it's an important journal of that right. time. Nova Galiza, even some in Galician as well. Right. Uh, and uh, it, it was the time in his life when he wrote the most political uh, or politically oriented uh, texts. Right. Did this eventually, once uh, Franco you know, won... Uh, did this affect his situation in Spain? Oh, greatly, yes, yes, uh, for sure. Uh, he was one of the many writers who uh, had to flee Spain. He um, went to France. He was separated from his wife for a while because he was in turn in a concentration camp oh, wow. uh, in France for a bit. But uh, in the end, he was able to um, go to uh, Holland and then from Holland by boat to America, uh, not to North America, but in this case to South America, uh, and he settled for a while in the big, important city, city of Buenos Aires. Yes, yes. Uh, he, <laughs> an he, exciting he, place. <laughs> it was very uh, exciting, in, in particular for um, Spanish writers at right. the time. And they had a artists. lot of Galicians, actually. And that's, you know, one of the yeah. reasons why... Down there, they, they call, call him, uh, everybody many, Gallegos, right? Exactly, yeah, exactly, uh, yeah. Even though they're not from Galicia, some There's of them might be from Spain, but they still refer to Spaniards as Gallegos. Right. So many Galicians were living there. Uh -huh. Now, there's Galicians all over the world. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, then, uh, you know, w w what I think is interesting is that he had to flee Spain, but he arrived in Buenos Aires at a time when there were so many of his friends living there so many of his, you know, fellow artists with, li uh, you know, like-minded people. Mm -hmm. uh, and so these years of exile are years uh, when Dieste worked uh, for an Argentinian publisher mm -hmm. as the director of publications. Uh, he wrote stories, he wrote articles, uh, he worked on several translations into Spanish of mm -hmm. different works. So he didn't, uh, he didn't want for work. Right. Uh, it was a productive time. Very much life. so, yes. And it was, this, it was the same thing for many um, uh, Spanish writers who were in exile uh, in different parts of Europe and uh, particularly in, in uh, Latin America. Uh-huh. Now, uh, he would keep traveling, though. Mm -hmm. he, was he didn't in, stay in Buenos Aires? Not the whole time. He, 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 in, in the late 40s, in 1949, um, Dieste and his wife traveled back to Europe because he was commissioned by the Museum of Modern Art of Montevideo to prepare some reports about contemporary European art. So, so. you know, now he's out there right know, up collecting his alley. Da data. Yes, right up his alley. Exactly what he likes to do. Uh, so he got the chance to go to Belgium, to go to Holland, Italy, France, sort of like a whole European swing, you know, from different <laughs> countries. However, he decided he didn't want to go back to Spain. Well, Franco was still in power at the his time. His wife did go, though. Oh, she did? And uh, she didn't have any problems? Because some of her uh, family was still living in Spain, okay. so she was able to go visit them. But uh, Diesta said, no, I'm not going to do it. I, you know, I don't want to break my exile. Right. You know, I'm, I'm not going to go to Spain. And he didn't. Um, it was at this time that he lectured in Spanish at Cambridge. He was offered a position for a couple of years, and mm -hmm. he accepted it. Um, and also, after he went uh, back to, to America, in this case to uh, North America, <laughs> because right. he went to Mexico, um, he taught at the uh, University of Nuevo León. That, right at, at that point in 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 Mexico, um, right, and he would you know spend the whole mm, you know a, a, a big part of the nineteen fifties uh, living uh, on American soil, right, um, Mexico, uh, Uruguay, uh, Argentina, uh, right, for 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 a long time. So he really really has a, a you know personal knowledge of these different places and and the culture. 
Latin yes. American culture. Yeah, very much so. He was um, he was a very interesting person. He was uh, a very bright uh, critic, mm -hmm. uh, cultural critic, uh, literary critic, art critic, uh, critic of, of of different things. Really, mm -hmm. he didn't concentrate on just right. one uh, thing or just one field, but, but a very a wide a, array of topics and interests. That until the early 1960s when, um, I think it was either 1960 or 1961, that he actually decided it was time for him and his wife to go back to Spain. Okay. Um, he was not going to stay in America any longer. He didn't think that being in America served any real political purpose. Right. Mm, and so he just decided, listen, I'm going to go back to Spain. Right. His wife, of course, was in agreement with that. They both decided to returned to Spain, and of course they chose his hometown, his hometown of Riancho. Yeah. Uh, How far is that from Vigo? Not very much. Uh, uh -huh. It's not in the same province. Uh -huh. uh, Vigo is in the province of Pontevedra, uh -huh. uh, a little bit in the south of, uh, well, not a little bit, quite a bit in the south of Galicia. Uh -huh. And uh, Riancho is uh, several miles north of uh, Vigo, I'd say about two hours away. Okay. Uh, by car, um, in the province of La Coruña. Okay. So... Yeah, and that, that's where he lived until the um, end of his life, until he passed away in 1981. Uh, he remained quite active, writing essays, uh, and sometimes he wrote essays on things like math and philosophy. Wow, that's uh, w One of his uh, essays is called, ¿Qué es un axioma? Yeah. <laughs> what is an axiom? You know, uh, so he really was quite theoretical there. <laughs> yes, he could, he, could be, he, could, he could abstract himself from the world around him uh, quite a bit, but at the same time, uh, he was a very sharp critic of, of um, you know, more mundane things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, he reworked also some of his er earlier plays and, 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 and books, short story collections, he wrote newspaper articles, and he was uh, very much uh, on demand to give all sorts of lectures. He, mm -hmm. he, he spent, you know, the 60s and the 70s doing lecturing uh, that quite a bit. Um, until he passed away in 1981, uh, and he left behind uh, a huge body of work. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a body of work that's that's really impressive in in, in how wide it was, um, how good it was quality wise, and um, I think at some point um, his uh, complete works uh, began to be published. I'm not sure that all of them have come out, but there was an, an effort uh, by uh, a publisher uh, mm -hmm. in Galicia to bring out uh, his complete works. Right. I'm not sure that it's finished at this point yet, but I, I have seen some of the uh, volumes and it, it, was, it, it was really voluminous. Right. <laughs> <to> <laughs> Lots of least. volumes that were very voluminous, yeah. <laughs> You're listening to a new episode of... Tracing Tech With... Sylvia and Anton, and today, right here in Tennessee, we're discussing the work of Rafael Dieste, one of the lesser-known authors from the generation of 1927 in Spain. So now we're going into more specifically uh, what in English we call from the Goblin's Archives, right? His that's work. right. That's a that's a work that he uh, wrote originally in 1926, mm -hmm. um, originally in Galician and Gallego. Mm -hmm. Uh, the title is Dos Archivos do Trasno, which mm -hmm. means from the Goblin's Archives. Uh, it would later be translated into Spanish, not by himself, but mm -hmm. uh, by somebody else. Um, one of the interesting things about this uh, collection of really short, short stories um, is that it was totally different from what other Galician and Spanish writers were doing at the time. Right. Um, Dieste was not always interested in uh, realism per se. Right. And so one of the things that he was absolutely fascinated by was uh, mystery, the supernatural, uh, the horror story, all of those elements appear. Right. Even from the title, you can tell, from the right. Goblin's Archive. Exactly. Um, and so this set this work apart from other works uh, of the time. This was before Álvaro Cunqueiro, right. uh, we the, whom we've talked about, uh -huh. uh, began writing his novels um, that we've you know, talked about also. Uh, and so this was really a pioneering work when it comes to you know, using the supernatural, right. or at least hints of the supernatural in, in, in Galician literature. 
another interesting thing about this uh, collection of short stories is that it was published in 1926 originally, but uh, Dieste would get the chance to revise this work twice throughout his life. Okay. So right after he uh, went back to Spain in the 60s, uh, in 1963, mm -hmm. um, he revised it for the first time, adding more stories. Okay. And then in 1973, adding a few more stories, uh, he published the definitive uh, version. version of From the Goblin's Archives. So mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, it's something that he just simply liked to do. He did it with other plays uh, mm -hmm. of his. He would just uh, reread them and revise them and kind of adapt them in different ways. Mm -hmm. Um, he did this with uh, uh, the Goblin's archives. Mm -hmm. um, but the interesting thing is that stylistically, it's almost impossible to tell the difference um, between the stories from 1926 and the ones that he wrote 40 or 50 years later. Mm -hmm. now, if you don't know which are which... Then you wouldn't, tell, you wouldn't be able to tell which, chronologically and that's which incredible. came first. That's, yeah, that's, so that's he's amazing. very consistent in his style. He basically, he very clearly knows what, what he wants to do. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that is for, for sure. And, mm -hmm. and, and he's very, like you say, consistent would be the word mm -hmm. uh, you know, to describe that. Um, unfortunately, we don't have an English translation, uh, but it was translated into Spanish by Cesar Antonio Molina, and it was published by Austral in 1989, at least the uh, uh, edition that I have in mm -hmm. my hand, and the, the one that's easiest to find, right. if you would like to read it in Spanish, because uh, there's not a possibility at this point to read it in English. Mm -hmm. It has not been, to the best of my knowledge, translated into English. I think some of the uh, stories have. Right, but not, but the, not whole the whole collection. Book. Do you know if it's been translated into other languages other than Spanish? I, I would know. I really, okay. um, I'm not sure about that. It's possible that it mm -hmm. has been translated to other European languages, but uh, I'm not sure about that. Mm -hmm. uh, I do know that some of the mm, stories can be found online in mm -hmm. Spanish. Right. You know, uh, I don't know about the copyright right. issues or all of that, but... But um, they are available. But they are available. You, can, you, could, you could find at least some of them uh, online in Spanish. Yeah. So um, you mentioned that he incorporates, you know, the supernatural mystery and so on. And I'm curious because since he is a Galician writer mm -hmm. and we know that uh, Galician writers often have a very, uh, they're very much interested in the folklore mm -hmm. and like that Celtic past. Do we find this as well in Diestas work? We do find some of that, uh, but uh, whenever he uses the supernatural, he doesn't do it in a very ex explicit way. Okay. There's always a hint of the supernatural, okay. like a little taste of it, you know. Right. But he's not necessarily interested in uh, writing about ghosts or writing okay. about spirits, but somehow introduce a little hint right. of those the, the possibility. Possib yeah. Exactly. He opens. Uh, kind of like you said, like it's like looking through an archive and, and finding that it's there, like the traces of it. That's right, and I, and I absolutely love the title because right. it's, it's called From the Goblin's Archives. Now, mm -hmm. what goblin? Now, <laughs> exactly. Are, do, do goblins exist? Do, <laughs> and they, do they even archives? have archives? Yeah, do they know how to write? You know? uh, how did you have access to that? Um, I don't know. That's the idea right, <laughs> yeah, right, right exactly. there. You know? uh, so the idea that the supernatural could be a part of our lives, right? but not necessarily be totally su explicitly supernatural. supernatural. It's just kind it could of... seem supernatural to us. It may not necessarily be that. Mm -hmm. There could be a logical, a rational explanation. Right. Not that he gives it in the story. Right. You know, and, and, and in that respect, is different from you know other writers that right. deal with the supernatural, like Anne Radcliffe, who you know oh, always yeah. explains you know right. what happened and why. Right. Uh, not in the case of Dieste. If you're looking for answers, uh, just like with Cervantes, you, you know you're not going to be happy. No, <laughs> it's going to be inconclusive. That's true. I mean, mo most of the time, at least uh, in the stories uh, from from this book, which is my favorite book by Rafael Dieste. And I think you can tell mm -hmm. that. Yeah, you get really <laughs> excited. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I kind of do. Uh, and I like to, to present some of the stories in, in my classes of literature uh -huh. because, well, first of all, because he's not a very well-known writer and you know, I like to give him some visibility. Right. But also uh, because I think the students like the short stories that right. are fairly easy to understand but that make you you know, think, think a, a little, little more. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying they love to, to think about them necessarily, <laughs> but they like the idea that... that the stories are easy to understand. Right, exactly. So, yeah, that's one thing. Now, um, 
in many of the stories, the supernatural is introduced in a real life situation. Uh, it has a certain kind of impact upon the lives of the characters, uh, whether it can be explained rationally or not. You know, sometimes mm. it could be, sometimes not. But he doesn't do it. He no, lives, it's up he lives to the reader. To you as a reader. Right. That, that's right. Uh, the characters never see the supernatural as something normal. Right. So this is not the magical realism in the style of Alvaro Cunqueiro or in the style of the boom writers. Right. Um, it's simply the supernatural is supernatural. Is supernatural. And it is something odd, something that can't be necessarily explained. And it's, and treated, as, have... it's treated, really treated as odd by the characters, by the narrator, and as you will see when we get to the two stories that mm -hmm. uh, we will uh, discuss today mm -hmm. uh, towards the end of the, uh, of the podcast. Now, one thing that I really like about this... Um, uh, book is the prologue. There is mm -hmm. a prologue in this book uh, in which Dieste explains how he approached the writing of these stories mm -hmm. in uh, from the Goblin's archives. And I would like to read, you know, some parts of these because they look almost like uh, like aphorisms, right? You know, uh, uh, really short descriptions of what he thinks the story should be like. And I mm -hmm. think it's necessary to read that prologue before we um, deal with the stories because mm -hmm. it gives us sort of like a framework um, from, uh, you know, a, a point of view from which to look at the, at the stories. Right. So one of the things, let's see what you think, uh, Sylvia. Uh, he says, Emotive unity may be achieved in a story by means of the obsession with what is to follow. So basically he's talking here about the uh, idea of suspense. Right. Right. Exactly. Keeping... Um, the, the the reader engaged and wanting to find out more. That's right, and and that's a, that's a, it's a, in in a way it's a plot driven idea, but right. uh, he he kind of peppers this with other things. Right. He says the ending should have the virtue of making images that were successive appear now simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting because uh, the successive is linear, but simultaneity suggests some circularity or maybe a uh, parallel, like if we think of a parallel universe. So that's interesting that he uses those two words to explain, uh, you know, the, the ending or the, you know, how the narration is going to come to a close. I kind of link this uh, with uh, the idea of mystery, you know, right. because when you read a mystery novel, you know, things are successive, but towards the end, you know, they have to come together somehow. Right, there's some, you come full circle, right. So, to it's a little extent. bit of that, and that's uh -huh. the that's the mysterious element right. in the in the stories. Then he says the presence of the ending should be covered, but strongly latent in all parts of the story. Mm -hmm. So again, it's it's again the same idea that you cannot surprise the reader um, in an unfair way. Right. You know there has to be some clues exactly, along the way. Elements. That it's almost like there is a a detective narrative, like a detective story. Like there has to be some clues in you know, a very sharp reader should kind of have some sort of ideas. What? Yes, even though they're not detective stories, you know, but, that, but that there same are... idea should be at work. Right. Yes, uh, because, you know, when you get to the end, you have to, if you think back, you know, you start thinking, oh, that's why this happened. Exactly. You know? And, and that's, that's basically what, what, what he's trying to explain. Uh, another thing he says is the ending is an image that makes the story explode in its last words. Now, the stories that he writes in this book are very short. Mm -hmm. They're really short, short stories. They're brief. Um, so everything is sort of con condensed. Right. You know, it's very direct the way that he tells the story. When you get to the end, this explosion is almost like an epiphany in some cases. You right. Know, you, 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 you come to the realization that, oh, this is what happened. Mm -hmm. uh, you may not know why. But, but you, you come to this ending... And, and finally, my favorite here is is this this metaphor that I he uses. I love it. Yeah. He says the story is the flutter of many butterflies around a lamp, all of them immersed in the same light. Isn't there a poem by Poe about I mean, like uh, some like like fireflies coming around the? Lamp? There may be. I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, I was thinking about that when you you know kind of gave me some notes on Dieste. 
and I I have to look into that because I'm curious. It's not it's not impossible uh, uh-huh. because bearing in mind the kind of stories that he wrote, uh, there's no doubt that he knew right. the work of Edgar Allan Poe. Right. So it is possible. And I just can't I'm, remember like and I, love I know Poe. I I, know, I know I have heard some sort of Poe like maybe not Poe but maybe a I know I've heard a poem with this not the exact same metaphor mm-hmm. but. A similar one. So well, that I, might be our that might um, be uh, some that might in, be our homework. Huh? Yeah, exactly. For the next I time. just <laughs> couldn't think of it. <laughs> and that's basically what what he uh, what, what the prologue says. There's mm-hmm. a couple more things right. he says, but those are I, I guess the highlights of this really short prologue that gives you an idea of what kind of work he's trying to do right. with these stories here. Um, and really, when you read the prologue and then you go on to read the stories uh-huh. um, it really it really checks it really right. clicks you, you understand that what he says in the prologue that he's trying to do is really what he's doing in the stories and right. I think that's that's very that, that's very very interesting really and it's one of the reasons why I like this this book so much and I've brought it today to this new episode of Tracing Text which is what you're listening to right now a new episode of Tracing Text with Sylvia and Anton and then I step on your toes again I, you, <laughs> you, you needed to say Tracing Text that's Sorry. right that's okay Rafael so, Dieste is our author today and so now we're going to get into a, a couple of his short stories uh, and you know give us a taste of what these stories are like and hopefully then our readers could go online and read some of these hopefully and maybe if they read in Spanish or Galician they might even be interested in one day translating some of these texts. <laughs> that would be nice, yeah. yeah. I don't want to do it but you know. But uh, I'm sure someone out there might. It would be a nice project. Yeah, it is. A, sure. It would be a nice project. Now the two stories that I've chosen are the first and the third um, mm-hmm. in the final uh, version of this book uh, which was originally published in 1926 but went through revisions until the final version of 1973. Okay. So, um, and the stories are called uh, Sobre la Muerte de Vieto, so On the Death of Vieto, or okay. in Galician, En Col da Morte de Vieto. And uh, the other one is called A Volta, in Galician, or El Regreso, in Spanish, uh, The Return, okay. in English. So mm-hmm. if you um, think that's okay, we'll start uh, sure. with number one, the first one in the in the collection. And this is how the collection uh Opens on the death of Bieto, uh, and this is really, I would say, probably my favorite story in the whole uh, uh, collection uh, because of the complexity of what Dieste is doing in just two or three pages, because that's mm-hmm. how long this the story is. Right. Uh, it's the story of a pallbearer at the burial of his friend Bieto. Uh, so as he is helping carry the coffin the narrator starts having doubts about whether Bieto is actually dead or not inside the coffin. So that, that's, that's the premise. He, he thinks right. that he has heard Bieto scratching the coffin. Oh, and that's so typical you know. of, uh, isn't there a, sto- a Poe story? The premature like, burial. Yeah, yes, yeah, exactly. Right. Oh, that's scary. <laughs> <laughs> so he's thinking this. Um, he's thinking that he has heard Bieto scratching the coffin, uh-huh. rapping at the coffin, but he doesn't want to tell anyone about he this <laughs> because he isn't sure that he is right and he doesn't want to be ridiculed. <laughs> He'd rather live, leave his friend in the coffin. <laughs> and what's interesting is that you get this sort of interior monologue uh, of him right. debating whether with himself over whether he should, you know, bring up these, uh, you know, these this doubts. suspicion that he has. Uh, but then he thinks that people would ridicule him if he's wrong. He thinks this, the family of Bieto would be... Uh, mad at him for pulling a prank on them, you know, that, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And so he decides to do nothing. He actually tells one of the pallbearers, hey, what about, what do you think? What if Bieto were, were still alive inside the coffin? And the other person just starts laughing at him. And so mm-hmm. he, that's like, like the last nail on the coffin. Right. You know, so to speak. <laughs> and he decides not to do it. Right. Right. Uh, but he feels remorse about this. You know, all day long after the burial, he feels remorse. And so he decides that... Uh, he's going to go to the graveyard at nightfall, and he's going to make sure that, that Bieto actually... is actually dead, buried and dead and gone. Uh-huh. He just wants to make sure, make sure of that, okay? So he arrives at the graveyard at night, and he applies his ear to the grave. Uh-huh. Just think of that. <laughs> <you know? laughs> he, this person has just been buried, and he's you know applying the ear to uh, the grave, and he thinks again that he can hear Bieto inside still scratching. 
And so he thinks, well, what am I going to do? Now I have to find a spade and dig him out because right. he is actually alive. Uh -huh. He's not dead. He wants to dig Bieto out, but at that moment he hears somebody walking near the cemetery. And he gets nervous. He thinks that people will find him out there. He, he thinks that people will think that he's some sort of body snatcher or something right. like that. And so he runs away. Oh, my goodness. And that's the end of the story. And that's it. So we're left wondering whether or not Be Beito was actually dead or not. And, and so, and, and I guess the horror of, you know, that this dead friend could have, could have had faced if he were not... That, th dead. that is true, and you know, um, the the uh, to me the interesting thing is that at the end of the story, we as readers have no idea mm -hmm. if you know this is true or not. Right. The way in which it is told, from the perspective, you know, uh, focalizing everything through this person, that it's it's so, sometimes you, you might think uh, that there is a hint of the fact that maybe he's out of his mind or he has mm -hmm. a mental problem because. You know, nobody can hear this, but he can hear it. Is it true? Is it not true? That 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 idea, that that that, that element of doubt, mm -hmm. is there right. uh, all the time, uh, and I think that's that that's really interesting because uh, nobody else can hear Beato scratching, not even the other pallbearers. Right. And we would have to take his word for it. Basically, uh, we we simply can't be sure. Uh, basically, what's happening here is that Diesta is just playing with the reader's expectations right. the whole time. The reader isn't sure right. at the end about exactly what happened. And exactly what happened is not important. Right. It's, it's not this, necessarily It's important. the suspense and the doubt that, that the situation raises. Which is what he has been right. talking about in the problem. Mm -hmm. You know, he is really, mm, in many ways, uh, hard at work trying to uh, create this, this suspense, this tension that is never resolved. Mm -hmm. Or is resolved in a very unsatisfactory way for the reader. Right. <laughs> because we don't know exactly what happened. Is exactly. this a figment of his imagination? Is this true? Is it right. not? We, you know? we not. Uh, really, uh, the idea is that Dieste uh, is, is really not using um, a supernatural element per se. He's just, no. he's just giving us a hint of the possibility of the supernatural. Or more like, I think... Uh, within the context of these stories is like not necessarily supernatural but death itself becomes this element that is well it's it's feared mm -hmm. and then you know it kind of uh provokes in the reader fear mm -hmm. simply because of this unknown with death so that's true so because it, it death in and of itself isn't supernatural but the, no, that's but right. But the 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 horrific part is being buried alive. That's true, and and if he had been, if Bieto had been buried alive, there could be a very logical explanation right. for it. Back, there could be know, a scientific it did happen. explanation. It did right. happen in the past. If you think of the premature burial by, right. by Poe, that's exactly. that, that's that's an obsession of that character. In right, that, in the Victorian in era, this di well, we know that this did happen, and and there was a reason for that. So, so yeah, it's yeah. A, it's it's really what what um, Dieste is doing here. He he's working on a, a very simple scenario, uh, but making it complicated. You know, uh, very subtly complicated because we are not sure exactly what happened. The the narrator is extremely unreliable, mm -hmm. and in many cases says, "Did I hear this? Did I not hear this?" You know, the the, the narr narrator himself is in doubt. And so that also kind of suggests a little bit of uh, the notion of madness. Uh, so that, too, uh, are, is an element often that we see in these types of, you know, in the genre itself. And in the way in which it is told, right. the story is told, when we have access to the uh, uh, interior monologue, of the, uh, to the thoughts of these characters, uh, this particular narrator, for example, you know, we, we are always unsure about uh, whether he really is out of his mind or not. Maybe he isn't, or maybe he is. But, you know, in any case, what, what we have to work with is the text. Right. Uh, tracing text, right? Right. We have to follow what's, what's there as our, kind of as an, we're investigating in some way, and we have to stick to what we have. And the text itself doesn't really and give you an answer. You know? right. So don't look for answers in... <laughs> 
the Goblin's Archives, because once you delve into the Goblin's Archives, there's not going to be almost any satisfaction in that respect. There's mm -hmm. other kinds of satisfactions that you can get from reading the story, but not necessarily, uh, you know, a closed, clear-cut ending. Right. So, you're listening to a new episode of... Tracing Text. With... Sylvia. And Anton. And today we have Rafael Dieste. Well, he's not here, unfortunately. He no. died in 1981. I, this is the kind of person that I really would have loved to have, you know, have some coffee or, yes. or, or a little wine with her. You know, yeah. A little interview. That, a would, that would be nice. See, sí, una tertulia. That's the kind of thing that he loved, too, because <laughs> right. you know that, that, that it, it seems like a lot of these writers spent a lot of time together you know, at cafes, right. uh, writing and talking about things. And you know, it's, it's, it's one of the uh, interesting things about these writers who were in exile right. in, in Argentina or in Latin America uh, or, or wherever they yeah. were. They I always mean, found some time to yeah, get the, together. The, the idea work. of that time uh, spent at cafes talking about literature is just very prevalent. Yeah, oh, I, I wish they had done podcasts. Too, I you know. know they had recorded. Well, the, this is kind of our. We're simulating <laughs> that uh, in in a in a virtual kind of sort of way. Yeah, you got now. some soda. I got some water. <laughs> That's you know, right. No, no red wine or al or, or anything no, like that. No, we don't that, have but. any of that. <laughs> <laughs> but we do have the text, and the text is uh, from the Goblins' archives, the Los Archivos del Trasgo by Rafael Dieste. Uh, now. Uh, the next story, the one with which uh, we will uh, wind down the conversation, um, is uh, in, in, in Galician, it's called Avolta, uh, El Regreso in Spanish, mm -hmm. or The Return in uh, English. Um, this is a more, this story has a more explicit supernatural element, because, uh, well, it's the story of an old widow, her name is Resenda, uh -huh. Uh, whose husband passed away uh -huh. almost willingly after their son, Andresinho, so little, An uh, little Andres, or little Andrew, uh, went to do his military service in the land of the Moors. Oh, so he's in Morocco, just like our, yeah, he our does, author. He, he doesn't really say that it's in Morocco, <laughs> but, but you we can tell. implicitly you know. You can sort of right. tell. Uh, maybe an autobiographical hint there. Or? Yes. Uh, so he went, uh, you know, the son, Andresinho, went to the land of the Moors for, uh, to do his military service, and he never returned. Uh -huh. So one night, uh, Resenda, who is now a widow, because uh -huh. her husband willingly died, <laughs> uh, he didn't want to, to stay alive without you know, his whole family with him. Uh, Resenda has not lost hope for the return of her son. And one night, she hears some soft footsteps mm -hmm. upstairs. And suspects it could be her son. Now, she has this obsession, of course. Right. You know, but she hears footsteps okay. and suspects it could be her son. So she goes upstairs, she opens the door to a room, and there is Andresinho. Okay, so how did he get there? Looking like himself, but seen by the woman under a very strong light. Okay. Okay, and it, it, it's a night. Okay. So, um... Some woman who happened to be walking by the house heard Resenda shout. Some of the villagers even thought that they'd heard her singing and talking to herself that night. But we don't know anything exactly about what happened. Did, did, is this really Andresinho? Is it again, uh, you know, is it her son? Is it a figment of her imagination? Right. Is she too obsessed with this? Is it really a, a, a ghost? An apparition, yeah. What kind of, you know, what is, what is happening here, right? We don't know. It's not, it's not said in the story. We hear about, you know, the rumors that some of the villagers, you know, um, uh, had and, and, you know, uh, talked about, uh, but we, we don't know. The following day, though, when uh, her neighbors knocked on the door uh, to no avail, they decided to tear down the door, mm -hmm. tear down the door uh, to her house, and they saw the old widow lying on the floor with her eyes wide open. Oh, gosh. <laughs> and dead. Even though it didn't look <laughs> like she was dead. But she looked like she was dead. dead. <laughs> yes. Now, how, how, how does that make you feel? Well, I wouldn't want to find an old woman on the floor <laughs> with her eyes open. That would freak me out. <laughs> well, uh, it, it, it actually, um, 
you know, it seems to have freaked out a few of these villagers as, yeah, as, as well. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> to, to such an extent that uh, the story ends that way. Uh-huh. Uh, and we have absolutely no idea what, this what was. happened to, to, to this uh, character. Andresinho. Uh, Andresinho, no, we have no idea what happened to him. We have no idea what happened to her either. To, because to we don't know exactly why did she died. Was it from, you know, absolute happiness or fear that That's caused right. this? Well, she obviously died because of some strong emotional <laughs> reaction. To so there this. could be a logical explanation, right? You know, it, it doesn't mean that she was killed by a ghost. No, it just means but. she could have been so unnerved by mm -hmm. this that she dies. And at the very end, it says, "De Andres nunca se supo." We never knew anything about Andres. Todos dicen que fue comido por los cuervos. In oh. Tierras de la Moreria. So, <laughs> basically, um, everyone says that he had been eaten alive, or, or not, I don't know, eaten no, just by, by the, crow the crows in, in Moorish lands. Yes. So but that's a rumor. That's a rumor. You we know, don't know that for sure. That's hearsay. We're not sure exactly what happened. Again, as you can see, um, we are left without a clear-cut explanation about what happened to these characters. There's a certain degree of doubt as to what happened at the end of the story, the reader, you know, you or me, uh, we're now talking about this. We, we, we're left to ponder what we think from the information, very little information that Dieste offers in the story. And remember that Dieste always is very direct. Right. It's not flowery in the least. Uh, and so, you know, that's, to me, that, that's, that's one of the uh, greatest things about this book. One of the most attractive things about this book is that, you know, everything is very well told, very well narrated, but there's no satisfaction at the end about what has happened here. Don't be yeah. looking for a closed ending, is what I always tell the students when we read right. the Vieto story. You you know, have to don't be... worry about the ending. He's not going to tell you exactly everything that happened. I think what he's wanting to do is to, like, it is this, uh, he wants to evoke or... or ha have an emotional response from the reader. And if you have that emotional response, as a writer, he has succeeded. Basically, is, is kind of his style, what he wants to do, what he wants to accomplish through these uh, stories. And I think he does. I think mm -hmm. he does accomplish that in most of the stories. There are several others. You mm -hmm. know? Um, uh, there's one called The Suicidal Child, for mm -hmm. example. So, so some of these uh, stories uh, have um, some elements of mystery. Right. Uh, some of them have a little hint of the supernatural. Right. Um, and all of them remind us of this long tradition of folk tales. Right. Uh, of Galicia, which, um, you know, it's a very rich tradition uh, right. from which to draw. Right. And that's basically what Rafael Diaz is doing in this, in this book, which really, I would say... It's one of the most famous uh, books in, in, in Galician literary history. Mm -hmm. uh, still taught at schools, as I said mm -hmm. at the beginning, and very rightly so, because it's a, it's a book that makes us really think about um, not just um, ideas of, of uh, you know, um, the world around us, of, of how, you know, ideas like madness, uh, ideas like obsession could affect our lives. Right. But it also makes us think about uh, the mode of telling a story, right. the way of narrating a story in, a, in, in an effective way, but in right. a way that, that creates tension, right. uh, whether it's resolved or unresolved, mostly right. unresolved right. in the stories here. I think it's really a masterful way of, of, of doing this. Uh, and Diesta was, for that reason um, alone, uh, I, I, would, I would include him in, in, you know, uh, a, a comprehensive history of Spanish literature. Right. Uh, because, you know, he wrote not only in Gallego, but also in Spanish. And um, he wrote, he, he, he always had mm -hmm. uh, a, a very clear idea of what he wanted to do whenever he sat down to write a story or, or, or a play or, you know, a... a one of the many, you know, hundreds of articles that he right. wrote throughout his life. That's fascinating. Um, and it was, it's been so much fun uh, hearing about some of these very interesting stories. And it's actually a genre that I particularly like. So I thought you I, would. <laughs> I know. It's really, it's really something, yeah, that I love. So I, I'm hoping to also read some of his work 
in the near future because I was not familiar with Rafael Dieste. Well, here at the library, we have uh, his, we have the book. I, I the, made sure they the, ordered that we had it. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I really appreciate you uh, bringing this topic today to our podcast, Anton. So, do you want to add anything else in closing? I would just um, uh, I would just like to just I guess. Tell everybody out there uh, that um, if they have a few minutes and they want to read something interesting, they could look up Rafael Dieste. Some of the stories are found online, mm -hmm. or maybe you might be able to find this edition of De los Archivos del Trasco, translated into Spanish. Uh, and if you like it, it's always a good idea to try and find this little book. The only book, as far as I know, written in English about Rafael Dieste by Estelle Irizarry, simply called Rafael Dieste. Okay, uh -huh. she didn't have to think much about that title. <laughs> uh, published as part of Twain's World Author Series in 1979. Uh, I know it's still available on Amazon because my own copy of it I bought online. Perfect. So, really uh, good author to discover if you have some time and you like the you know, supernatural horror mystery and that sort of thing. And I think I, most people do. And so I think this is definitely a worthwhile author. Now, Sylvia, I know that we are uh, very, that we have been and we still are very busy with different pursuits. We always uh, are busy. We always are. But we uh, want to keep our uh, podcast, uh, it's our tertulia basically on literature, and we very much enjoy it. So we are hoping to bring another episode soon um, in December before uh, the holidays. And it'll be my turn. And so I had mentioned that I wanted to talk about Valeria Luiselli, a Mexican author. She's contemporary. Uh, her novel, Faces in the Crowd. And um, we had kind of changed that up when we talked about Borges when we did our 10th episode. So I think, you know, I definitely want to go. She's not a femme fatale because you know how <laughs> I love the femme fatale. But you're, you're changing gears here. But I'm changing gears a little bit. We'll go back to the femme fatale at some point because I have lots to say. <laughs> <laughs> Just like you have a lot about Galician authors. So. That's true, that's true. <laughs> but uh, Valeria Luiselli, um, I think, is a very interesting writer. She's young. She's writing a lot and well-loved by critics both, uh, you know, critics in the Spanish-speaking world as well as North American critics. So I think it's, uh, and, I, and I enjoy her writing very much. So that'll be hopefully our next podcast. And the text is going to be Faces in the Crowd. Yes, exactly. That's her novel, Faces in the Crowd. Remember also, uh, everybody out there, that uh, this uh, podcast will be available on YouTube. It will be available on iTunes and on Podomatic as well. Exactly. And when you download through iTunes, you can, in fact, subscribe to our podcast. And if you have your iPhone, our show can automatically download. And that's really great. <laughs> and that's how, I, that's how I would do it. Yes, exactly. And we really appreciate comments, any suggestions um, that you may have for us or questions, and we would gladly answer those. We have an email address, too. That's right. And you can reach us by email at tracingtexts at gmail.com, and that's T-R-A-C-I-N-G-T-E-X-T-S at gmail.com. Okay, well, um, not much more to say. It's been a pleasure as always, Sylvia. Thank you so much. Uh, and this has been a new episode of... Tracing Text. With Anton. And Sylvia. Signing off now from deep in the heart of the state of Tennessee.